So hey, um, we are starting a brand new series. It's called You Are Loved. We're so excited about this summer because we have a whole lot of faith that this summer is going to be a life-transforming summer for so many people that you have influence over. You have friendships and you have relationships at the workplace and, and family members that we could never reach maybe with, our church, with, with just a, a platform and a microphone and preaching the gospel. But I thank God that you have influence in their life so that you can share your faith. You can love them with the love of Jesus Christ and their whole life can be changed because you are a minister in their life. Come on, say, somebody say amen. And so that's what we're saying over this whole summer, the next two months, that, that we would just have the radical love of Jesus Christ in our hearts for people, and that so many people would encounter that love of God. Come on, how, how many know you, you are loved by God, and if God loves us, then we are going to love the whole world. A few people in the front are, are grateful for the love of Jesus. I'm so glad for that. Um, well, we're starting, in, and I want to talk about, uh, I want to give a message called Unity Matters, and really, I want to start off talking about unity because... I really feel like Jesus gives us kind of a pattern in John chapter 17. We're going to get there in just a second. But before we can reach the world, we need to be united at home. And what I'm sensing God wants to do with us in this moment and today is that he wants to unite our church to a new level, a higher level that we've never even experienced, that we would become one body like Christ calls his church. Before, that we, before we go reach the world, that we would reach each other with love. Um, go to John chapter 17. We're going to go to verse number 20. We're going to read a few verses there. And uh, if you want to go to Romans chapter 12 as well, we're going to be over in Romans chapter 12. But I'm going to start out in verse 20. It says, I don't ask for these only. Basically, Jesus is here, and, and I just want to give you some context. He is uh, preaching a sermon to his disciples, and it starts in John chapter 13. And it's all the way, John chapter 17 is just about the end of it. And Jesus is just about to be arrested, put on trial, and he's about to go to the cross. So it's right before he's arrested. It's right before he goes to that trial where he's beaten, he's mocked, he's ridiculed for saying he's the, the son of God. And it's right before that moment that Jesus is sitting down as disciples and he's preaching a long-winded sermon. I love long sermons in the name of Jesus because Jesus is preaching them. If you, love, if you come to New Hope Chapel, you better love long sermons. Can you say Amen. And so Jesus is here, he's, he's teaching them some things before he is about to depart. How many know if, if you're going to say like some last words before you die, you're going to say some really important things to your disciples? So here he is, he's, he's kind of taking them on a, on a spiritual journey of a message, and he gets to this point where he starts to pray for them. John 17 is known as the, the high priestly prayer. And so he's praying for his disciples, but verse 20, he kind of switches gears, and he says, I don't ask or just pray for these only but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one. Go ahead and say one. Go ahead and say one. Can I just say, I just precursor, it's okay to like engage with, with the message. Do you realize you can shout me down, you can say yes, you can say amen. Come on, try it out real quick. Come on, say something. I just want to like, all right, so get used to that, because so, so we can engage with this. Um, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one even as we are one. I and them, and you and me. That they may become perfectly one. Go ahead and say one one more time. Ready? Here's why. So that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. O oh, righteous Father, even though the world doesn't know you, I, I know you, and these that you have sent me know you. I made, them, uh, I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved th me may be in them and I in them. Can you say amen? Let's go over to uh, Romans chapter 12. I want to read a couple verses, starting with verse 3. It says, for the, by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body, you're going to say one body, we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this opportunity to get together with the church, to unite around the scriptures, to 
Lord, your word says that, that your word never returns void. It always bears fruit. It's always doing something. So God, I thank you that as I'm just a normal average person, your word is going forth and piercing the hearts of people, correcting some things in our hearts and minds. And Holy Spirit, I just sense that you're going to begin to work in this service to convict us and to bring us into a place where we will have a, a, have a, a pledge that we will not um, be a participant in division, a participant in gossip or slander. God, just correct us where we need to be corrected this morning and give us a spirit of oneness and unity in the name of Jesus, we pray. And someone said, amen. come on, can you say amen one more time? Amen. My nephew is seven years old on Stacy's side and he, um, he, loves, he loves playing with Legos. He's, he's like Lego obsessed. And so uh, every time I'm around him, He's always talking about Legos. He's got the brand new like Ninjago Lego set or whatever it is, the Star Wars Lego set, the, the, the Batman Dark Knight Lego set. He's got every kind of Lego set. You should see his room. It's, a, it's, it's like a mountain of Legos everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's all about Legos for this, for this young man named Ethan. And so he's such a fun kid. So he's, he's always like asking for anytime he, it's his birthday or Christmas or whatever he needs to get. He's always Legos. And by the way, Stace, just a reminder, he, he, uh, his birthday was recently, and, and a couple weeks go by, and he came up to me, I don't even know if you know this, Stace, and he was like, hey, so, uh, and we forgot, we totally forgot to get him a gift, so I feel really bad about that, so Stace, we got to go after church to get him a gift, because he came to me, and he said, hey, so, um, what did you get me for a, a gift again? My birthday was two weeks ago, and I was like, you're unbelievable, have some respect, no, I'm just kidding, <laughs> couldn't believe it. And so one day he asked me to, hey, hey come, play, come play Legos, come play Legos. So I went over to go play Legos with him. And, 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 and so he starts, it was a brand new Lego set. So he's opening this thing and, and like he's opening the little like the plastic packet. And he's like opening this thing and they're like flying everywhere, all over the floor. And I'm a little kind of like, like, I like order and cleanliness. And so I'm like, oh my God, this is really weird for me. It's, they're all over the floor. And so I'm like, I'm going to humble myself and just enjoy this moment with this seven-year-old kid. And, and so I'm pretty sure I swallowed a few of those tiny little pieces you got to look under a microscope with. And, and so either way, so they're going everywhere. And, and we're trying to like build this Ninjago Lego set. And we're trying to have a good time. And, and I, re I learned some things um, as I was uh, playing with these Legos, I learned that uh, in instructions um, are, are required. I learned that real quick. I learned that, that, that in the instruction manual is there for a reason. They place it in the box. I don't know if you knew this. They place it in the box to help you. And so I discovered that real quick because I had no idea what to do because there are so many tiny, tiny little pieces that are going everywhere. And I also realized really quickly that, um, that these pieces... There's so many individual, unique, different pieces that all have a different role, all have a different function, but they don't have the purpose in and of themselves. Like when they don't, by itself, like a little piece of a Lego really doesn't have much purpose. It doesn't have much good, to be honest with you. You can't build off of one little piece. But here's the last point I'm trying to make is what I learned is that when all of these pieces, individual pieces, different functions, different roles, when they come together, it builds something so great, like a Ninjago cannon, or whatever you want to call it, and it builds something so great, and that, that whole kit is able to operate at its fullest potential. Why? Because all of the pieces were put together. And what I'm sensing God is doing right now, just prophetically in our church, but also in the, the South Shore region through things like Glory of God, South Shore, and Gathering Conference, and, and all of these things that are happening is that God is trying to assemble and unite his church. That every one of us in this room is a unique uh, role, has a unique function, has, we are individuals, we, are, we, we have our own giftings, we have our own personalities, we have many different ways that we, we are living, but guess what, when we all come together, the church is able to reach its fullest potential because we are saying, I'm going to lay my life down for the church and the kingdom of God is going to advance and the gospel is going to go forward and many people are going to believe in Jesus because we are coming together in unity. And listen, I believe this summer, I, I totally, like, I really believe, like, I'm crazy enough to believe that this summer, we're going to see such a harvest as people finally realize the God of the universe in the form of Jesus Christ loves them so much that we will go out and we will do acts of kindness. We will pay for people's meals. We will give a huge tip to our waitress. We will do these radical things just to prove to people, my God loves you so much and you are his son and daughter and he created you in his image and he just wants to have a relationship with you. I believe this summer so many people are going to give their hearts to Jesus through our church. 
Why? Because we're realizing that it's not just up to the, the pastors wearing skinny jeans and sneakers and ha- wearing mustaches on their face. I don't know why I brought attention to that. I'm feeling insecure, so. And, and it's not about us just, just preaching the gospel on a stage. It's every single one of us have a stage, have a unique platform to speak to the lives of the people around us and let them know God loves you so much. Come on, Jesus came to this earth. He saw a sin problem. And he didn't just sit in on his throne in heaven and, and, and do nothing about it. Jesus sent his son to the world to bring the solution to this sin problem. There was a chasm between us and God. And Jesus wanted to close in that chasm. So he went to the cross. He, he bled for us. He absorbed the wrath of God, took our sins on his shoulders. And he died the death that every single one of us deserved. He rose again on the cross. On the, uh, he rose again from, uh, from the dead on the, on the resurrection Easter Sunday. Hello. And we celebrate that the triumph of Jesus Christ because of what he has done for us. And all we are trying to say is every member of this church, every member of the Capital C Church is a minister everywhere you go. Why? Because you carry the truth, you carry the light, you carry the love of Jesus, and whatever you, I want you to be a force for the kingdom of God everywhere you go. I'm saying that's going to happen this summer. I'm just trying to elevate your faith. I'm just trying to give you the, listen, I, I, I just believe, I don't, this, if this is a foreign, like, foreign idea to you, I just, I hope you can come to the conclusion that the church is the, the most powerful force on planet earth. It is the most powerful force on planet earth. In fact, I hope that before you leave, that really one of the things that you just get from this whole message is that your faith is elevated to the fact that the church is the most powerful force. But here's the deal. It, will, it won't reach its full potential if it's only the pastors and the church leaders and the elders and the deacons and the ushers and the, the people with a microphone in their hand. If that's the only th- way we view ministry of those people, then the church will not reach its full potential. Why? Because my Bible in, in Romans chapter 12 says every member is a me- every single member has a specific function. And if we're not functioning in our purpose, we're not reaching the full, full potential of the church. And so my encouragement to you is, is Let's get involved. Let's see the kingdom of God advance through your life. Let's not have a crutch, all oh, my pastor's preaching. No, we want you to preach the gospel to people around you and love them so radically that you would win them to Jesus. I just heard a story recently of, of, of one of my mentors, my dad's mentor, Larry Titus. His, he, he was talking about how he and his father were so sim- similar. After he was saved, his father gave his heart to Jesus in a vineyard. After he was saved, he was not much of a preacher. Like Larry, Larry, Larry Titus says that he, he, the, the second he started preaching, the Holy Spirit left because it was so bad. But, but something that was crazy about him is he had this radical love for every person that he encountered. Everyone that he encountered, he had this burden and love for their soul. And so what he would do is because uh, his wife would go preach and do these, uh, do these events all over, all over the country and preach, um, before the event, he would go to the church and he would ask the leaders and people, like, what is the names and the addresses of, of your loved ones that, that are not saved? And he would go knocking on their door, and just because of the radical love that he had for them, they, by the end of the, the meeting that he had with them, they would be saved, they'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, they would, they would know that they're a part of the church, and it was amazing. Why? Because it was love. Listen, if you can't preach with a microphone in your face, that's totally fine. You can love somebody tomorrow. You can love someone. You can love someone radically. And that's why the church is the most powerful force in the, on planet Earth. Because we, are, we have been given the Holy Spirit, <laughs> for, for starters. We, we have the message of truth. We have the message of hope. So it doesn't matter what anybody is going through. When you encounter them, you have the hope of their eternity within you. And if we would just love people this summer, I'm just believing that God would send his spirit. He would draw them to himself and they would be saved and give their lives to him. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. I'm trying to elevate your faith this morning. I need you to know this one thing, that you are a minister. Go ahead and say, I am a minister. You're a minister of the gospel. And that's exactly what Romans chapter 12 is saying is, is we all have different gifts. We all have different relationships and influence and, and personalities. And God uses every single bit of that so that you would function in your purpose to be a minister of the gospel everywhere you go. That's the whole idea, that you'd be a minister of the gospel wherever your feet take you. You you would represent Jesus to the people around you. And here's the deal. I think sometimes we mistake prominence for significance. We think that the people who are prominent in in any church setting, those are the ones who who are doing the real work. The people who are seen on a stage, the people, you know, leading worship, 
the, the, the elders, those are the, the prominent ones in any church. Those are the real important ones and those are the significant ones. But I'm here to let you know that don't mistake prominence for significance. You have such a significant role in this church. You have a significant function. You have a significant part to play. You ever like, just to go back to the Lego illustration, you ever like been building some Legos or something like that? And Because like every single one in this room is like seven again and we all play with Legos. Either way. I don't do that, but when I do, um, what I realize quickly is that it's oftentimes that the, the Lego piece that you need to finish the building or whatever you're building is the one that's missing. You know what I'm talking about? It's always the one that's missing that you need. Here's the deal. I don't want you to be the piece of the puzzle that we need in this church. I want you to say, listen, I've been coming here for a while. I've been sitting in a chair but I want to contribute to what God is doing here because I realize I am a minister and I've got something to say and I've got something to add. I can add value to this thing. That is what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Don't mistake prominence for significance. Let me ask you this. What's more significant, my nose or my heart? I'm sorry, what's more prominent, my nose or my heart? You can see my nose, but you can't see my heart beating. But let me just tell you this. My heart is way more significant than my nose. I can live without my nose. I can't live without my heart. I'm just trying to let you know, don't mistake prominence for significance. You have a part to play, and I, and I just want you to function in the God-given destiny and purpose placed on your life. So come on, just believe it, just receive it, do something about it. If you've been coming for years but haven't, haven't contributed to what God is doing, haven't started sharing your faith, let's start seeing, the, let's start seeing that, that, that power of the Holy Spirit come over you, and let's start operating in faith, and I believe God's going to do something so great. Can you say Amen. Listen, that was a, kind of like a little diversion. Okay, let's get back to this message. I just believe that the church is the most powerful force on planet Earth. Jesus said this, I will build my church and the, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Gates were defense mechanism, mechanisms back in the day that would defend the city from whatever enemy was trying to attack. And here's what, the, what Jesus is trying to say. He's saying not even hell itself is protected against what the church is going to do. Not even hell itself, not even darkness itself can withstand what the church is going to do. If they are united, it'll be the most powerful force we'll ever experience. It'll be the most powerful thing this world will ever see. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The fact is this, we were given a mission. We were given a mission. And the mission is this, to simply reach the lost and dying world around us. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them all I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you to the very end of the age. He said, listen, go and make disciples. Why don't we just start right here in Plymouth County? Why don't we just start with your neighborhood? Why don't we just start with the workplace that you go to every day of your life? Let's start invading these dark spaces with the light of Jesus Christ. I just, God has given us a mission and it's the most powerful force on planet earth. But not only that, he's given us a means of accomplishing this mission. And I want to get into that because this is John chapter 17. Jesus is giving us the means of accomplishing this mission. And he takes a moment out of his sermon to stop and to pray for his disciples. And he says this, Father, I, you know, I don't just pray for those who are in front of me right now, like my 12 disciples. I pray for those who will believe in me and confess that I am Lord. So how many know Jesus is here? He's actually praying for you and I. Do you know that Jesus is praying for New Hope Chapel in 2019 in Plymouth, Massachusetts? That's what Jesus is praying. Come on, isn't it encouraging that Jesus is praying for us? And Jesus continues to pray for us. And so he said, I, I pray that, Lord, I pray. Think about it. Of all the things Jesus could have prayed. He says, I pray that they would be one like I and the Father have perfect oneness and unity. I pray that they would carry that same oneness with them. I pray that in the way that they act and talk and do, I pray that they would be one. And then he goes on to say, so that the whole world will see, the whole world may believe that you have sent me into the world and that you have loved them even as you loved me. See, here's the deal. According to Jesus' idea here, the world sees the love of God for them when the world sees the church loving one another and uniting. 
That's like this, you want go to go to the Bible, how are we going to reach people? It starts with being united at the home front. And I'm just going to be honest with you. I mean, I don't step, mean to step on toes, but I'm just like, I'm so tired of a church that's so divided. I'm so tired of a church that, that, is, that is dividing over denominations, dividing over minor theological points, dividing over how, we, how the, the style and preference of worship. I'm going to get into all that. I'm, but I'm just tired of seeing the church that, that has every reason to be divided. But for everything we disagree on, there's a thousand things that we do believe in, that we do agree on. If we believe in Jesus Christ and the Holy, that he is Lord and Savior and the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Come on. Those are things that we can get behind. And, those, and we can move forward in unity for what he's saying. Come on. This is... This is oneness. This is what united, unity looks like. I love the glory of God, South Shore. Anybody know the glory of God? Have you been to, who's been to a prayer meeting? Man, don't you love what God is doing? He's taking a, I just, for so long, I feel like the church has been isolated from one another in different names, different places, but, but not together. You know, what, whatever the, the, the denomination was, we only stick together. We don't, we don't mess around with other people. Listen, I'm Baptist, so I don't mess around with the Pentecostals, man. They're crazy. I'm Pentecostal, man, so I don't, I don't play around with Baptist people, bro. Come on, can I, I'm just stepping on people's toes right now. I don't really care. I'm just going in. Because here's the deal. We can no longer be the church that's going to suffer from, from, from not reaching the lost because we are so focused on being divided. Can we just say, like, no more? Dad, can we just say, like, I love, I love this is so my dad's heart. No more disunity. So I love the glory of God because what we're saying over this region we're going to unite the church. The church is going to unite. We're, we're going to go past all of the preferences, past all the differences, and we are going to unite as one body. Yes, we're in different cities. Yes, we're in different places. But guess what? We are the one church, the capital C church. It's a global movement. Get on board with it. <laughs> I love it. One person. Oh. <laughs> that was amazing. I want to give you a hug after this service, so just come up to me. <laughs> If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down, the first point. Unity is the start of great evangelism. Unity is the start of great evangelism. Jesus says, I pray that they would be one like I and the Father are one, so that the world may believe you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Listen, I love like great evangelistic strategies and insights and tools. I'm all for that. We, we equip our church with, with a, a book, booklet called Reach. It's a way of, you know, you can walk, walk through the gospel with people and share your testimony, all these awesome tools. I love, like, you know, I love, like, tracks, you know what I'm saying? Like, you ever got a track, you're walking by someone in Boston, they give you a track or whatever? Um, I, there's one track I'm not a huge fan of, I'm just going to be honest with you. If you, if you pass it around, I'm, I'm sorry, but there's one track that looks exactly like a $20 bill. Anybody seen this? It's crazy. It looks like a $20 bill. It's, like, folded perfectly, so it looks exactly like a, like a 20 and, and I guess you give it to someone like that, they open it up, they realize immediately it's, it's a totally fake $20 bill, and it has a scripture where Jesus says, uh, you can't serve two masters, either money or God, which one's it going to be? I'm like, hey, I'm just, I don't, you hand me a $20 bill, I'm going to get real excited, and then it's not a $20 bill, I'm going to be really defeated right away. So if you pass those out, I mean, God bless your soul. Um, I love those things. I love tracks. I love like the Romans row, like working people through the book of Romans and, and like, you know, showing the sequence of like our sin. I love the, the you know, creation, fall, uh, redemption, restoration. I love walking people through the, the gospel narrative in the Bible. I love all of that. But here's Jesus saying, he's saying, all of your efforts for evangelism, they will fail if your church is not united. All of, the, the, all of the, the things that you do for outreach, guess what? That's great. I'm going to applaud that. But guess what? If you're not united at home, it's not going to work. Because God wants his church united before we try to reach people out there. And if we're all messed up in here, we're all kinds of jacked up inside the house of God. And we can't forgive one another and be quick to, quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to get angry. And we're, we're treating each other like, like terrible. But we, we, but we expect some sort of harvest out there. It's not going to happen. The Holy Spirit wants us to know that if we stay close, if we stay united, if we serve one another and love one another and give to one another, then guess what? It's going to overflow to the church, the whole, uh, to the world, because the whole world is going to see the love that we have for one another. John chapter 13, 35. Woo, going in right now. John chapter 13, verse 35. Jesus says, he's teaching the same sermon, actually, in John 17, John 13. He says this. He says, you will know that they are my disciples. The thing that's going to mark them that's different, the thing that's going to be like separate them from the rest, you will know my disciples by their love for one another. 
You will know my disciples for the, by the love they have for one another. That's what separates us. It's the love we've got. Here's my second thought if you want to write this down. Unite around purpose, not just preference. Unite around purpose, not just preference. You know, some people, they, they unite around, like, the things that they prefer. You know, like, their opinions. Like, I love, I love, like, man, I love Hillsong worship, bro. I love Hillsong worship. They didn't do enough Hillsong worship songs up there, so I, I'm leaving this church. Man, I just, like, they don't have hymn books here. And I'm more, I'm more like a hymn person, more like deeper than that. So I was like, ah, I can't worship with these people because they don't do hymns. Come on, I know I'm getting real. But here's the deal. We have to know what our purpose is. And our purpose has to trump whatever preference that we have. Like, do we know our purpose is the church? <laughs> our purpose is the church is to go reach the lost. Jesus said, I have come to seek and save the lost souls. I'm here for, for people to know me and what I can do for their life. I'm here to see transformation in people's lives and marriages and finances and, and how they live their lifestyle and the things that they do. I'm here to transform everything about them, to give them a hope and a future. Meanwhile, we're bickering and arguing about what worship style we need to do and what the lights need to look like and how we need to like either keep our hands down or lift our hands. And I'm like, come on, there's a world to reach out there. Are we exalting Jesus with our worship? Okay, then I can worship with you. We can be family. I don't care if if you do hymns, I don't care if you do Hillsong worship, I don't care what you do. If you're worshiping Jesus, I'm gonna lift my hands with you. I, I, we're family. Listen, there's a revival breaking out in China right now. I don't know if you know this. There's an incredible revival happening. All over the whole nation is, is getting like transformed. And it's crazy because the church is suffering so much persecution, yet the more persecution they're suffering, the more revival they're experiencing. And so they're like literally the government is destroying church buildings and wiping them out completely. And but people are just by the thousands, by the millions, are still meeting and still getting together and still uniting. And, and here's the deal. Uh, some American pastors, they went over to China to, to meet with some of these Chinese church leaders to be like, yo, how are you doing this? Like, what, how, are, amidst all this stuff, how are you, like, how, still, like, growing exponentially? What are, this, what are some of the things you're doing? And, and the, the, the Chinese pastors, they said, listen, we worship, we pray, and we read scripture. We worship, we pray, we read scripture. Yeah, but like, uh, yeah, no, that's cool, that's great. But like, what are some of the systems, you know, like what are like the formulas? Like what does your life group, you know, small group like system look like? Like, what, how, can you walk me through the process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we pray, we worship, and we read scripture. And because a church in China is united around that one fact, it's growing exponentially amidst radical persecution. And, and to be honest with you, I can almost guarantee some church members aren't leaving the church on a Sunday morning and saying, ah, they didn't do a hymn, so I, I'm not with it. You know, they didn't really, they didn't do like my, they didn't play Oceans. And so I can't worship if you don't play Oceans. Oceans is my song. Oh my gosh. <laughs> they didn't do my song. They didn't hit the cymbals at the right time. I can't worship with them. Are you serious? I'm going to a different church. <laughs> They're so united in China. Can we be united here? Can we let our preferences be second to God's purpose for our lives? Like, I love, listen, I, I love Chipotle, man. I love Chipotle. You might like Moe's, but guess what? I'm not going to, like, divide over you and try to fight you because you like Moe's and I like Chipotle. Why do we do this in the church? The other thing that we do this is, is with, like, minor, like, pet doctrines, small, like, minor theological points. Listen, I love, like, getting a conversation. I love, like, like, heck, you know, de debating for fun about, you know, how sovereignty and free will works out. That's fun. You know, like eschatology, you know, like post-trib, like mid-trib, like pre-trib. What are you, bro? Like, you know, let's talk about that. I love that kind of stuff. But if you don't agree, if you don't agree with me, I'm not about to, like, punch you in the throat. I'm a, I, like, do you know what I'm saying? I'm not going to leave your, I'm not going to leave you. Come on, this is some stuff. I'm just being real. This is some stuff that we have divided. The church has divided over in the past. These are things that are actually crippling churches right now today. 
But I thank God for New Hope and saying, yeah, we can disagree and we don't have to see eye to eye on absolutely every little point of theology and every expression of worship. But I thank God that you love Jesus Christ with your whole heart because so don't I. And I thank God you're filled with the Holy Spirit because so am I. And I thank God that you want to reach people because so do I. For every one thing that we like disagree on, there's like a thousand things that we can get on board with. We can just say, yeah, let's, let's take this city. Come on, let's do this together. Come on, preference is second to what God's purpose is on our lives. Come on, can we say amen to that? Hmm. Because what happens is if we make preference sacred, then we value the method over the mission. We value tradition over reaching souls for Christ. But here's the deal. Methods are always changing because methods are not sacred. The gospel is sacred. The message is sacred. If you ever try to change the message, then guess what? There, are, there is a le legitimate reason to disband. And when someone tries to change the gospel message, that is when it's appropriate to say, we, <laughs> I don't know about this. But if it's over preference, we're going to stick together. Because we don't value methods, we value the message. Come on, somebody. We, value we don't value tradition as much as we value all oh, what God's going to do in the future. And I thank God for a pastor who, like, expresses this so well, believes in the next generation, allows us to play weird, funky, groovy music during announcements. It allows me to wear skinny jeans and to grow a mustache on stage. I don't know why I keep, like, don't look at my stash. I'm really insecure. <laughs> I love, is Mark McCauley in here? Where's Mark? Is Mark McCauley in here? One of my favorite people ever. He's not here. Well, maybe he'll see the recording. I want to brag about Mark for a second because Mark has been serving so faithfully at the Gathering Conference every single year. By the way, uh, shameless plug for the, the Gathering Conference. Uh, you really should register six days away. You should do that. You should totally do that. Anyway, uh, Mark McCauley. He, he's someone that's been serving the park. He's been serving parking for, for two whole years. And yeah, come on. Clap your hands for Mark. It's incredible. And, and, and Mark is, you know, like he's older than I am, and, and, and he came over to me one day, and he pulled me aside, and he said, listen, I, <laughs> I don't understand why you do all the things that you do. I don't understand, like, you know, some of the music, some of the style, all that stuff. I don't get it. But here's the deal. I see the fruit, and I see lives being changed. I see the gospel going forward. So he said, I am 100% in support of that. And that is someone that knows how to prefer, knows how to, to, to allow purpose trump preference. Can we do that as a church? Can you say amen? I'm going to wrap this whole thing up. <laughs> the third point is this. The Holy Spirit is our emulsifier. The Holy Spirit is our emulsifier. Now, if you're like, yo, what do you mean by like emulsifier? What the heck is that? I've never heard that before. If you take water and oil and try to blend them, try to mix them, they don't, it doesn't work. They're not going to blend well. But if you take an emulsifier, something, an outside substance, like an egg, you crack that egg, you, you put that within the water and oil, you mix that thing together. The two things that could never coexist actually can dwell together, be blend together, and become one substance. That's an emulsifier. And I just want to say that the Holy Spirit in us is the emulsifier for how we are so different. <laughs> we think different politically. We think different Socially, we think different, we dress different, we talk different, everything's different. Listen, from the person you're sitting next to, there's a hundred things that, that are completely different about that person. The background, they, the, family, the, the, the family background they have, the, the experiences they have, it's all different. But the one thing that remains the same is the Holy Spirit that's within us. You have the same Holy Spirit that I have. And he is the one that can take two polar opposite people. And put them together in one room and through the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they can love one another so radically. It's the Holy Spirit who does that. Come on, in a nation that's so divided with, with, with politically and ethnically and whatever else, we can come together around one thing, Jesus Christ, and know that the Holy Spirit is going to keep this together because we can love one another through him, not just our flesh, but man, we can be governed by the Spirit of God and he can unite us and make us one. That's what I'm believing for the church because we see that worked out in Acts chapter 2. When the disciples, they, were, they, they followed Jesus, the 12 disciples, they followed Jesus for, th for three whole years. And Think about this. In one group, you got a tax collector, 
someone that would collect taxes from the, from the Jewish people and bring them to Romans, okay? A tax collector. And right next to him, you've got Simon the Zealot. Now, Simon the Zealot, he was someone like, the, the term zealot means you want to overthrow Roman oppression. So you've got someone who's like in cahoots with the, with the Romans getting rich off his own people. In the same group, you have some, Simon the Zealot who wants to overthrow the very people that are getting you rich. In the same people, you have a fisherman, the same group. You got a fisherman. You got the James and John, the sons of thunder. These people were so rowdy. They wanted to destroy a whole city. Jesus, can we just destroy this whole city with, with fire from heaven? Jesus like, <laughs> chill. I mean, you got this rowdy group of people, completely different statuses, completely different, you know, lifestyles, and they're all together, 12, following Jesus. And the one thing that united them was Jesus. But when he ascended, Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit was poured out on them. And the very thing that was able to start and sustain their unity all the way up until this day is the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit in me that I can be that I can have relationship with people that I would, I want to, you know, fight or hurt or whatever. Listen, there's so many people in this room, I'm just getting this sense before we, we close this service that, man, you have, there's so many, like, people around you and, and what happens is because you're immersed in, the, in an environment of gossip and slander and you just start to take on that as your narrative. You begin to gossip about people that you shouldn't be loving. Maybe in the same church, in the same small group, I don't know what it is. You start gossiping about them and slandering their name. And you, you start to become destructive with your words. Let me tell you this. Something that will kill a move of God just as fast as it started is gossip. Gossip hurts the church. It's devastating. It's so destructive. I heard a preacher say this recently. Listen, I, like I, I knew that I would sign it up for ministry. I knew I would be critiqued and criticized, but I didn't expect so much friendly fire. Let's be real. The people that have hurt you the most are probably the people that are in the church. And what we do is we, we start to judge people and we start to get a really bitter and cold and hard heart. And we don't have that tenderness anymore. We start, we, we, we can't love anybody because, we, because of what, you know, we're harboring in our heart and we become bitter and we become offended and we stay offended. You know that offense is an event that you can pass through, but offended is a, is a destination you're building a house on. If you're offended, we, we can't get past that. Man, I can't, but you don't know what they did to me. It's like, bro, that was 20 years ago. And I'm not downplaying what they did. That was 20 years ago. Jesus died for that. He can heal your heart. He can heal your soul. And you can become united with the church once again. Come on, it doesn't matter. Listen, our unity isn't based upon how people treat us. It's based upon what Jesus told us to do in John 17. <laughs> to unite. I know every one of us have been hurt. I know, I know every one of us has dealt with harsh judgments and criticisms and stuff like that. But can we, can we be the church and rise above that? To say, you are my brother and you are my sister. And I love you. Not because of, like, you deserve it or earn it. No, because I didn't deserve, deserve or earn God's love for me. I love you because you are a human being. You're a brother to me. You're a sister to me. And that's why I love you. Come on, can we have that kind of unity in our church? I believe what Jesus said. The whole world can see the love of God for their life when they look at the church that's one, the church that's united. If you would bow your head and close your eyes in this moment with me, I just kind of want this moment to be like, like private with, between you and the Lord. And I'm just maybe getting a sense, someone in this room, you, you know, you, you're new to this whole church thing. Maybe you've really never like come to church before. You're just kind of checking it out. Maybe you've been around for a while. You've been sitting in that, chair for, for a long time but you haven't crossed the line of faith you haven't decided in your heart I'm going to believe in Jesus the Bible says confess with your mouth that, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose again from the dead and you will be saved saved from what? death, hell, the grave eternal torment, sin forever you will live in eternity with the God who made you and loves you so much that's what you get, it's a free gift upon your confession and your faith in him Maybe you're saying, for the first time, I want to I receive this grace. I want to receive this love. I want to receive this hope you've been talking about for this whole 45-minute message. If that's you, I just want to all say a prayer together, out loud, all together. And I just want to see your hand. Father, go ahead, go ahead and repeat after me. Father God, thank you for sending your son to be my savior. He died for me, for my sin. He rose again 
and now I put my faith in him. He is my Lord and I will follow him. In Jesus' name. Now with your head bowed, I just want to see if there's anybody in the room, you prayed that for the first time, you meant it from your heart. I want you to shoot your hand up just between you, me, and God. I want to see your hand. Is there anybody in this room? I see your hand. Beautiful. Anybody else? Raise your hand. I want to be able to see you. Awesome. Awesome. I see your hand. Awesome. Let me just pray for you. Father, I thank you for the, the ones that were added to the kingdom of God today. I thank you that today your kingdom was, was advanced and grown. <laughs> new family members into this family. I thank you for saving their soul. I pray you'd fill them with the Holy Spirit in a new measure. They, they would experience your love and grace. Now for everybody, for everybody else, if you would stand to your feet, just go ahead and stand to your feet in this moment. I was asking the Lord how we should kind of close this message um, earlier. And I sense that God wants us to do something that might be uncomfortable for you, but I don't really care. <laughs> I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. Dad, can you take my hand? I want you to take the hand of the person next to you. And I want to close this service with you praying for, for the person on your right and your left, that you would bless them, that you would maybe speak an encouragement over them. I don't even care if you don't even know them. That's, I want you to pray over them. That you, would, that you would just pray that they would experience God. Whatever comes to your heart or your mind, I want you to pray out loud for the person on your right and your left. Let's go ahead and do that for a moment. If you don't know their name, get to know their name, but go ahead and pray for the person on your right and left. Go ahead. God, I thank you for unity in this church right now. I thank you that where there was rifts and wedges put between us and someone else, God, I thank you that you're, you're overcoming that right now, that you're allowing people to come into a, an experience of peace, that we would make peace with the people around us, that we wouldn't just live as people pleasers, but we, live, we would live as peacemakers, seeking peace with everyone. God, I thank you that there's offenses that have been developed in the hearts of people in this room that you are literally stripping off of people's hearts right now. I can sense, like, I see, like, the Holy Spirit just coming alongside you and breaking down some of that stuff in your heart. God, I thank you for the marriages that were just on the verge of, of just on the verge of splitting up. I thank you, Lord, that you've used this message to encourage them, that there's hope for their marriage, there's hope for their family. Lord, for those people in this room that, they have a uh, broken relationship with father and son or father and mother, daughter, mother, whatever it is. God, I thank you that there's a reconciliation in Jesus' name, that, that by your spirit you can do miracles with that, God. I sense a son right now. I sense someone's son. You're just like, it's such a broken relationship with you. Maybe they've just said some really harsh things to you recently. God, I thank you that that wasn't done out of, uh, with, with a heart that, that really means it. But God, I thank you that you're mending that relationship in the spirit. Do it more in Jesus' name. And God, finally, we just pray that we would be the fulfillment of your prayer in John 17. That we'd be one like you and the Father are one. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.